All right. Okay, everyone, welcome to this video lecture, Getting Your Dream Job, Getting the Interview. And we're going to talk about how the internet is important uh, for doing your job search now and how it's not your friend. We're going to talk about the resume, which uh, is important, but in a different way than you think. And we're going to be talking about the informational interview, finding a job by not looking for a job. So our first topic, the internet is not your friend. Hopefully you have a separate email account which has a very serious uh, and identifying uh, you know, name to it. This list here are some actual emails or uh, addresses that students have emailed me from or replied from. And these are horribly, horribly inappropriate if you're looking for a job or if you're communicating with a professor in any type of professional situation. So get a very professional sounding email address and you, I know you have one right now because you could always use your student email account with CUNY and that sounds very professional and most recruiters would not see anything wrong with it. But uh, now Google is essentially your resume and many recruiters once they get interested in you they will Google your name and so go to Google and Google your name and see what you can find about yourself and then go and make sure it's good. Uh, sometimes you say well Google finds everything well you can control the amount of information that you put out there on yourself. I was Googling some of the students in the class this semester as I do often when we talk about resumes and I've been finding different levels of information on people. Uh, for example, I know that you may have Instagram or Snapchat or uh, Twitter as your favorite social media account. Uh, one of my favorite social media accounts is Facebook and so I can control the amount of information Facebook will share with the Internet and Google uh, you know from this page here and then if I wanted to I could go to this page here and you notice that I believe you can see my pointer I can go to this drop down menu and click view as and now I am seeing my profile page as a public person would so a recruiter would find this and then you could scroll down and you can see all of the stuff I uh, have made public. Uh, I was surprised in getting ready for this that I have a lot of stuff that much stuff public uh, but I'm not looking for a job and so I really don't care and the stuff that I have that's public actually I've chosen that to be public and it does paint the picture of myself that I want other people or the public to think about me. So, if Google is now your resume, you want to direct people away from the bad stuff and direct them towards the good stuff. And so on your resume, you may want to actually include your Twitter handle. Uh, if, if this is your professional Twitter. Uh, you know, if it's just your personal one where you're talking about personal things, then you basically want not to do that. But if you have a Twitter account or some type of account, that's directly associated with your professional activity, definitely include that on your resume because you're going to direct the web surfing uh, of the recruiter. Uh, LinkedIn, yeah, if you have a LinkedIn account, include that. Uh, but uh, some recruiters say only do that if it's an interesting, if it's a very populated LinkedIn account, if it's like has tumbleweeds going through it, then you may not want to direct them to it. Uh, I've heard some bad things, by the way, about LinkedIn, about uh, their uh, issues with security and privacy. And so I deleted my LinkedIn account uh, a while ago and uh, only use a uh, ResearchGate account, uh, which does a good job with privacy and it is generally supportive of researchers. 
And so again, in your field, you'll have to uh, figure out which type of professional social networking is more, more appropriate for you. Okay, your resume. Uh, when we talk about resumes and writing a resume, you have to remember the 15 second rule. Or I've heard of the six second rule, or I've heard of the two second rule. And what these rules refer to is how often or how long, excuse me, a human being will take a look at your resume. And yes, so the 15 second rule means that the recruiter is looking at your resume for only 15 seconds and then they give up. I've seen some recent research that, uh, you know, there's a six second rule that is on average recruiters will look at a resume for six seconds before moving on. And uh, recently now, people are focusing on keywords uh, that uh, a computer could recognize. And so a recruiter, if they actually manually look at your resume, will only look at it for two seconds to basically scan the whole page in two seconds for the keywords they're looking for. Or a recruiter may put all of the resumes they get uh, you know, into a big database and then they search the database for the keywords they're interested in. So the two things we can pull out of this is that, uh, you know, you need to have information up front and up on top of the resume that is going to be your best selling point because when they get 15 seconds or six seconds into it, then they're going to give up. And the second thing you need to take out of this is to remember to include keywords appropriate for the job that you're applying for. And that really is so specific to the jobs, I really can't give you any advice. Of course, if I was applying for a job, uh, you know, uh, the keywords I would put in would be my, uh, you know, research abilities, the statistical software I use, the courses that I teach. Uh, those would be keywords. So it really is based on the field. And uh, so the second thing, general thing about your resume, besides the 15 second rule or the two second rule, is what do most recruiters look for in a resume? And I uh, know this because in one of my jobs outside of academia, I spent a lot of time looking at resumes. And uh, what I was looking for very, very directly was evidence that somebody could do the job. Because not only did I have to hire people, but I had to train them, I had to supervise them, and I had to dismiss them if they weren't doing a good job. Uh, so it was really to my benefit that I get somebody who I felt could do the job. And the way I and most recruiters would uh, do that is by looking to see if you did the exact job someplace else. Uh, one time I came across a resume and somebody had done basically the exact job except at another company in Florida and so I hired this woman almost immediately. So let's take a look at some resumes. This is uh, a resume a student turned in for an assignment and uh, this is after I talked to them about trying to get them to uh, do a functional resume and still it's really not getting through. Uh, and so let's apply the six second rule. So I start service-oriented receptionist with 1.5 years. Now I'm up to about six seconds. Uh, skills and abilities handles tasks with accuracy and uh, fit efficiency. Possesses. Now I'm getting to the 15-second mark. So I'm getting these very diaphanous, very fuzzy things about this person. Uh, maybe the one thing that I've picked up so far is that they're a receptionist. And so, therefore, if I'm looking for a receptionist, uh, I may uh, put this resume aside. Other than that, uh, I'm not going to really uh, you know, spend more time with this uh, resume. If I do and I get down to the employment history, one of the first things I find is being a medical receptionist. And here, down here, I see some good things in that uh, they list 
the student lists what she ha uh, did at the job. Uh, she verified insurance eligibility, confirmed appointments, uh, answered phone uh, calls, uh, collected co-payments. So if I was looking to fill a position like this, uh, and I did get down here, uh, this would be a great part of the resume for me to read, and it would make me want to interview this person. However, uh, people probably are not in York, at York, getting a bachelor's degree to end up as a medical receptionist. And in fact, she was already a medical receptionist before she graduated from York. And so, even if we very liberally apply the 15-second rule, I'll get down to this really good stuff here, but all that this is really telling me is that this is a good resume of somebody who would be a medical receptionist. And again, not somebody, not a job that somebody gradu graduating from York would want to get. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of problems with this resume. What resumes should do is they should present the information that you can do the job. And you should present that information right away. So, first off, you want to leave out objectives. Uh, since you're sending your uh, resume in, it's pretty clear that you want the job. So, saying that I want a job like this, uh, that's pretty obvious. So, that's only taking up time taking a second or so away from your six seconds. Uh, you don't want to summarize your skills uh, because if you go back here, you'll notice that the student did it fairly broadly. And we don't have any specific uh, skills, uh, you know, for example, handles tasks with accuracy and efficiency. What does that really mean? And would somebody actually say that they don't do this. Uh, possesses a strong problem-solving analytical research skills. What does that mean? What does strong mean? And so these are very diaphanous, not very clear, uh, cloudy. Uh, the only thing that we uh, get to that's very firm and quantified is 65 words a minute for typing and that they use Microsoft Office and uh, fluent uh, in Mandarin Chinese, uh, so that may be something more definite and quantified. But other than that, uh, here in these general skills and abilities, uh, we don't see anything that really is meaty enough for me to want to say, yeah, I want to put this in the pile of to look at later because I need somebody who is accurate and efficient. Uh, and however accurate and efficient they are, I, I really don't know. So you don't want to have an objective. You don't have a skill summary. And you really want to try to do something so you list the best job first. Uh, that is, you know, this, you know, I said that what I look for in a resume and what recruiters look for in a resume is that you can do the job. And so you want to get the job uh, that you've done in the past that matches the job you're applying for the best. And you can do that whatever way possible, but that's the way, if people aren't gonna look at your resume for uh, six seconds, you have to get that job first. Uh, when we talk about resumes, people generally think about chronological resumes. And duh, we list jobs in reverse chronological order. Uh, the last job first, and then we list skills by jobs. And really this serves the purpose of going from one job in one company to the same job in another company. And that's what recruiters are looking for. And so chronological resumes really help out the recruiters that way. And here we go back to this example uh, resume. And so we have a pretty good uh, chronological resume entry here. We list the skills by job. And so, again, I know that, well, if this is true, and I'm looking for somebody who did this, then this person is a good hire because they have done this stuff before. And so uh, I can be relatively comfortable that they could do it at my company. 
So uh, as we wrap up the basic ideas with resumes, some resumes tips, uh, include, include key terms. Uh, resumes are often screened by com computers. So make sure to find out that what those key terms are for your field and include them. Uh, list of education first if education is important to the job, if it's important to licensing. Uh, but if it's not important to licensing, then you're saying, well, my education is going to be part of that six seconds. So do I want to have somebody reading about the college, uh, you know, different colleges I went to during those six seconds, or do I want them to see the fact that I've done a job that they're looking for? Uh, so education, maybe one, you don't want to put that lo lower down. And then finally, don't list references. That's kind of passe. Uh, references are very problematic. Uh, oftentimes, uh, your past employers legally are warned not to say anything. Uh, when I was a manager, uh, our lawyers uh, told us that the only things that you can tell people who ask for a reference is the date of hire, uh, the date of separation, and the job title. And other than that, we are not allowed to say anything. And it's gotten, that's gotten so bad that people are afraid of being sued uh, that people really don't go for references that much anymore. So don't list references. If they want a reference, they'll ask you and you give it to them. It's as simple as that. Uh, other resume tips. Uh, avoid buzzwords. Buzzwords are vague terms that really don't mean anything. Uh, what you want to uh, do is use action words. Uh, action words are words that are verbs that convey some type of action. Uh, examples of these buzzwords and action words. Uh, recently there was a survey done of 2,000 hiring managers and here are their top 10 worst resume terms. And these are buzzwords, all of them. Best of the breed, go-getter, thinking outside of the box, synergy, results-driven team player. And in looking at student resumes in my classes, I have seen all of these worst terms very often. And here are the best terms from these 2,000 hirers. Achieved, improved, trained mentors. These are all action verbs or action words in that they describe what they did uh, by using some type of verb. You, know, you don't say that I uh, took uh, our company from making so much money a week to this much money a week, but I achieved a 50% increase in sales. Uh, found this really great site, uh, and the URL is down here at the bottom for action words uh, by different categories. And here are some of the uh, action words that they talk about central for uh, working on projects. That I centralized this, or I clarified that, or I converted, or I integrated these things together. Now I've talked about the chronological resume, and it's great from if you are leaving one company and going to another company in the same job. Uh, but what if you are at the beginning of a career or you're changing careers? And so I'm talking about a lot of students, you know, I'm talking about you getting ready to graduate from York because well, one of the points of going to York is you wanted to be qualified uh, to get a different category of jobs, a different level of jobs. And so you don't want to get a job that you've had during college. And if you're in that situation, then you want to look at the functional resume format. Uh, and it's not the chronological resume, it's functional. And uh, we call it functional because the skills are listed by skill clusters or by functions and not by jobs. And you include all the skills, all the functions that you have done in the past, uh, and even if they're not from jobs. So you'll include non-job experience. You'll include volunteer experience. You'll include uh, you know, uh, uh, internship experience. So the functional resume 
is you're not going to list your skills by job, but you're going to list them by what we call skill clusters. Uh, groups of similar types or categories of different functions. And then you're going to include all your skills and not just those from jobs that you were paid for. So let's review because students have a hard time recognizing this difference. Chronological resumes. The skills are listed by job. And basically what's going on is you're highlighting jobs, not your skills. And also you're going to ignore the skills obtained from non-job experiences. And this is not optimal for people changing jobs or careers or beginning a new career. And uh, in the textbook, the textbook talks about job analysis. And basically in a chronological resume, you're going to basically have it full of job analysis skills. That is, skills that are related to one specific job. The functional resume, on the other hand, skills are listed by not by job, but by skill cluster. And these skill clusters are areas of skill or function, uh, categories of different functions that you've done. And this is best for people changing jobs or careers or beginning a career. And, uh, you know, uh, from the textbook, the idea of work analysis, that is the skills that workers can take to their next jobs, that's what we're going to be looking for for the functional resume. So if you're going to do a functional resume, which I recommend you do, uh, how do you find these skills? Uh, first off, you have to raid your chronological resume. And the jobs that you've had and the skills and functions you've had in those jobs, you need to list what those are. So list them without the category of job. So take all those skills that you have from different jobs and just list them. Then think about volunteer experiences and different skills or functions you perform, performed in those volunteer experiences. And so list those. Internship experiences. Yep, so list those skills. Uh, unrelated job experiences. If you have a job that doesn't relate at all, but list those skills. And then finally, school experiences. Uh, have you been a leader of one of the clubs here at York? A president. Well, then you have leadership skills. And so, let's see. Oh, here's a great example of what I'm talking about and the difference between a chronological and a functional resume. And this is from a class where I've asked my students uh, to do a functional resume. And this is not a really great functional resume. It's actually received a failing grade. The reason why is you notice that they list work experience and then notice it's a chronological resume. And so they list this chronologically, they list this by they list the skills by job, and this was not good. And this is what I mean by students don't recognize this. But take a look at this for a second. Uh, this student is uh, in uh, you know uh, business human resource management. Uh, that's her major, so we assume that's what she wants to do when she uh, graduates from college. Read this and apply the six second rule. I get down to about here with the six or 15 second rule. So I know that she can do uh, you know, hair color, you know, a, 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 a beauty salon, receptionist stuff. I know she could be a cashier. That's the type of job I would wanna put this person into. But then look at this, look at what she buried down here at the bottom, her internship, where she was an HR assistant. That's what she really wants to get the job as. So as long as you're stuck here in this chronological format, you're really not going to be able to highlight what's really important among your skills. And here is an example of a really good functional resume that a student made. Uh, up here, I cut this off at service experience. Uh, suggested new, I would change that to develop. In fact, I told the student to do that. Uh, service experience, also I told them to put human relations experience above service experience. And in fact, service experience, you may want to put that below technology. Uh, but other than that, this is a good 
uh, you know, functional resume. Notice that things are listed by function, not by job. We have employment history down here. Uh, Footland, Walgreens, North Shore Hospital. Uh, but now the student can focus on and highlight and emphasize uh, the skill set, the functional skill category, whoops, I want to go back, that for the job they're applying for. So let's say that you apply for a job uh, which is mainly about leadership. I would move this section up to the top, the leadership experience. If it was mainly uh, working in HR, I would move that up to the top. And that's the benefits of the functional resume. And again, uh, education, because it's not important, you know, and more or less it isn't, it's not important uh, to have a bachelor's degree to get jobs that the student will be applying for. It's appropriate for it to go at the bottom. And all that I've cut, up, cut off up here at the top is just the student's name and address. Okay, so uh, you have a chronological or a functional resume. And so you're going to finish the resume. What you want to do is proofread it. Uh, you want to proofread it like crazy. 60% uh, of hiring managers will reject a resume based on one error, one typo, one spelling error, one extra space. They will use that, 60% will use that to reject it. And I've done that myself. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I get so many resumes. I got used to get so many resumes, I just had to limit it somehow, and that seemed like one way to do it. And then you have a finished resume. What do you do? Well, first off, just posting it on monster.com doesn't work. Uh, those big data set repositories uh, are not very useful for getting your resume out there. Uh, you could send it out cold, that is, just send it to companies that you're interested in working for. But in general, about 95% of resumes and almost 100% of those sent out cold don't get read. So, uh, you know, how do you get your resume noticed? And this leads us to our last topic, the informational interview. And a great site uh, is at, uh, from Cal Berkeley. Uh, and I would encourage you to go and take a, a good look at this. But let me just, you know, uh, you know, take a few minutes to describe what the informational interview is about. What you want to do is you want to identify people who do the hiring in your field. And you want to contact them. And you want to say, you know, my name's so-and-so. I just graduated from York College, and I'm looking for a career in blank. And... Uh, I really, you know, and then when you, what you do is you somehow, during your research process, you say something that, you know, that somehow complements the person you're contacting. I know that you talk to uh, this group about, you know, the field, you know, at this meeting last month, and I thought you would be a great person to, to talk to about this. Could I come by? I'm not going to ask for a job. I, I just want to ask your advice about how to look for a job. Can I come by for about just a 10 minute meeting uh, just to talk to you about good job search uh, strategies? And they may say yes or they may say no. Uh, but if they say yes, then you have an informational interview set up. And you go for the interview. And you set up some questions about, you know, and you plan ahead about, well, can you tell me about what important things I should be emphasizing about myself when I reach out to hiring, uh, you know, uh, managers and companies. And then you talk about, uh, you know, do you know anybody that's hiring uh, in other companies? The one thing you do is you promise them that you would not ask for a job, so you definitely do not ask them for a job. Uh, so that's the one thing you do. Another definite is if you save 10 minutes, then 10 minutes and then you're out of there. You keep the clock yourself. And uh, even if it seems that they want to talk more, you say, well, I promised you 10 minutes and I'm going to really stick to that. If you want to talk some more, we can uh, schedule another appointment, but I want to stick to my promise. And what you're doing is 
useful in two ways. First off, if they are hiring, uh, then uh, you are going to basically show yourself off to them. And if they ask you for a resume, give them a resume, but they have to ask. And then secondly, uh, you're asking them about making contacts, contacts, excuse me, and networking in the field. And so then if they say, well, you know, I know somebody else in another company is hiring, uh, you may want to talk to them. Then what you can do, you know, they say Mr. X is uh, hiring over at this company. Then you can go to Mr. X and you can say, hi, my name is Joe Blow. And Mr. Z told me that I should contact you if I'm looking for a job in this field. And the one thing good about that is uh, you're getting some type of networking going and that, you know, you're saying that, well, Mr. Z sent me. You're not saying exactly how he sent you. And so that kind of implies that Mr. Z felt was worth your while to talk to you. So that's adding that really interesting perk, uh, you know, to uh, your reputation. And so that's what you do. Uh, finally, follow up the job interview, send a thank you note or send a thank you email. Uh, and, uh, you know, keep in contact with the person because now they're part of your professional network. Uh, the informational interview has been around for about uh, 30 years or so, and so some people, you know, some career professionals know about it, and so make sure that you follow all of the rules for the informational interview. And the important rules are, uh, if you say 10 minutes, and you should say 10 minutes, you're out of there in 10 minutes. Do not ask them for a job, uh, and of course, always compliment them and keep it positive. So let's see, or is that's pretty much it for yep that's the blank screen so that's it uh, and this is only the beginning of your job search or the beginning of your learning about how to look for a job uh, there are lots of resources uh, on the internet and elsewhere where you should follow up bye bye